In 1999, the idea for a company was born. It would be called iSmell, and would be able to connect to people's personal computers, allowing them to not only take in information from the internet through sight and sound, but also through the sense of smell. That's not what this episode is about, but I wanted to bring it up so we can all be grateful that the eye smell never caught on, because today, we're talking about London's Great Stink of 1858. Just a heads up, this one is pretty gross. In the unusually hot summer of 1858, the horrible stench of human excrement rising from the River Thames was spreading through the streets of London, through the halls of the House of Parliament, and into the nose of everyone who couldn't afford to flee to the countryside. The lawmakers, who couldn't work some days given the egregious stench, agreed urgent action was needed to purify London of the evil odor that was commonly believed to be the cause of disease and death. The outcome of the great stench, as that summer's crisis was coined, was actually one of history's most life-enhancing, yet little-discussed achievements in urban planning. It was a monumental construction project that, despite being driven by dodgy science and political self-interest, dramatically improved the public's health and laid the foundation for modern London. But as the heat wave hit the city and caused the extraordinary amount of waste within the river to ferment, British newspapers constantly referred to the river stench, with one article stating, Gentility of speech is at an end. It stinks, and whoso once inhales the stink can never forget it and can count himself lucky if he lives to remember it. In the early 1800s, sanitation looked very different than it does today. Many homes didn't have any toilets, instead they may have a closet with a bucket inside that would allow them to relieve themselves during the night. And in the morning, a night soil man would come to collect it to be used in fertilizer. But, especially after the flushing toilet was marketed to the masses at the Great Exhibition in London in 1851, bathrooms like we might see today began to take shape. Yet, the ever-growing metropolis of London was lacking the necessary infrastructure to get rid of everyone's waste, having just enough piping to get people's number two into the city's royal river, the Thames. And as the population of London over doubled between 1800 and 1850, making it the largest in the world, it's not like they had much of a precedent to go off of. What was once called the Silver Thames by early powers had become, in the words of a royal institution scientist named Michael Faraday in 1855, an opaque pale brown fluid. Dropping pieces of white paper into the river, he found that they would disappear from view before even sinking an inch below the surface. He wrote about the main contaminant. Near the bridges, the feculents rolled up in clouds so dense that they were visible at the surface, even in water of this kind. This was echoed in many articles and cartoons at the time, as the river had become one of the most polluted metropolitan waterways in the world. The fumes alone, it was believed, could strike a man dead. What really made the water lethal, however, was that a great many Londoners were drinking it piped directly from the Thames. Even the water pumped from outside of the city risked contamination with sewage when it reached the streets, as the wells they were often pumped to risked coming into contact with the waste people would dump out of their windows into the street, as was a practice at the time among those who hadn't gotten a flushable toilet yet. In 1834, the situation was getting so bad that someone described it like this. He who drinks a tumbler of London water has literally in his stomach more animated beings than there are men, women, and children on the face of the globe. That's not exactly reassuring. As is normal with similar cases of fecal infected water, waterborne diseases such as dysentery, typhoid, and most importantly cholera wrecked the city. It was called the Victoria Plague, of which there was no cure. The first major cholera epidemic in Britain, in 1831 to 1832, killed more than 6,000 Londoners. The second took more than 14,000. Another outbreak in 1853 to 1854 claimed a further 10,000 lives. With the bodies piling up, the people and the press pushed for change. The poet Thomas Miller wrote in the Illustrated London News, Let us then agitate for pure air and pure water, and break through the monopolies of water and sewer companies, as we would break down the door of a house to rescue a fellow creature from the flames that raged within. It rests with ourselves to get rid of these evils. All the while, there was a man who was going to make a stunning discovery about how disease spreads. Investigating cholera spread in the London neighborhood of Soho in 1854, the physician John Snow, wait, no not that one, Dr. John Snow, 
had deduced there that the cause had been contaminated water. His evidence included the 70 workers in a local brewery who only drank beer and all survived. Yet it was an uphill battle to convince the public officials. The commonly accepted idea at the time was called the miasma theory. It stated that disease was caused by nauseous vapors in the air rather than the microscopic organisms. It was common for people to insist that all bad smells were disease. With his arguments largely dismissed, Dr. Snow died in 1858 at the height of the Great Stink. It would seem that even though the train of thought they used to get to the conclusion was wrong, the Houses of Parliament did decide that it was time for change. They believed the stench-inducing river infecting the city would need to be cleaned with one of the leaders saying that the noble river had become a Stygian pool reeking with ineffable and unbearable horror, and introduced legislation for the purification of the Thames and the main drainage of the metropolis. The Metropolitan Board of Works was given three million pounds and was instructed to begin working immediately. The board's chief engineer, Joseph Bazalgette, who had already spent several exasperating years drawing up plans for an ambitious new sanitation system, only for each one to be swiftly shelved, at last got the go-ahead to begin construction. Bazalgette's plan, which was modified in some details as construction progressed, proposed a network of main sewers running parallel to the river, which would intercept both surface water and waste conducting them to the outfalls at Barking on the northern side of the Thames and Crossness near Plumstead on the southern side. These combined sewers thus diverted rainwater and effluent downstream, well beyond the built-up city to the east, from where it would flow more easily out to sea. The network included 82 miles of new sewers, great subterranean boulevards that in places were larger than the underground train tunnels then under construction. With a minimum fall of two feet per mile, the main drainage sewers employed gravity to conduct their contents downstream, while smaller sewers were egg-shaped to encourage the flow. Pumping stations were built at Chelsea, Deptford, Abbey Mills, and Crossness to raise up sewage from low-lying areas and discharge it onwards to outfalls. The scheme also involved the huge challenge of embanking the Thames, creating the Victoria, Albert, and Chelsea embankments. Informed by Bazalgette's experience of land drainage and reclamation while working as a railway engineer, London's embankments were designed not only to carry tunnels, including the Underground Railway, but also to help cleanse the river by narrowing and strengthening its flow through the city centre. According to the Observer newspaper, every penny spent is sunk in a good cause, in the creation of this most extensive and wonderful work of modern times. And the work almost immediately proved its worth, in 1866, most of London was spared from a cholera outbreak which hit part of the East End, the only section not yet connected to the new system. As a classic piece of Victorian over-engineering, the infrastructure was planned to accommodate a population growth of 50%, from 3 million to 4.5. Within 30 years of its completion, the city's population had in fact doubled again, reaching 6 million. But it's a testament to the quality of design and construction that, with improvements and additions, the 19th century system remains the backbone of London's sewers in the 21st century. But the backbone is now severely strained. With a still expanding population, dramatic downpours associated with climate change, and the loss of green spaces to soak up the excess, the Thames is now once again at risk. Bazalgette provided for the extreme weather with overflows into the river to prevent the flooding of homes and streets, and those overflows are now being used more than ever, around 50 times a year. Which is why the construction of the Thames Tideway Tunnel, also known as the Super Sewer, is now underway, with its expected date of completion to be in 2023. When it's complete, it will be one of the largest civil engineering projects the country has ever seen. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you like this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thanks again, and as always, see you next time!